Ah, plane took off and left its pontoons behind. It's a powerful engine. I'm gonna catch up. See? Plane. See? Plane. See plane. I'm Hyatt Mamoon, and I'm a wildlife filmmaker and conservationist. I've made films across America, from the Great Smoky Mountains to the Wild West. And today, I'm joining my friend Tim Watkins from the National Park Service on an epic adventure. We're exploring the history of a national park 70 miles off the coast of Key West called the Dry Tortugas National Park. Hi, I'm Tim. I'm a biologist and science communicator. I recently learned that Dry Tortugas National Park includes the site of America's first tropical marine laboratory. But the tortugas are far away and hard to get to. So I wondered, what was this outpost of science, and why was it here? Let me tell you, the views from up here are gorgeous. What an amazing coastal seascape. The shipwrecks are ominous. Clearly, it was difficult and dangerous to be isolated from the mainland. Even from the air, I'm getting a sense for why scientists wanted to come way out here. We'll be joining Ranger Curtis, the lead interpretive park ranger for the Dry Tortugas, and a team of scientists to uncover the history of this unique park. And of course, we'll be capturing all the incredible wildlife and natural beauty of the Dry Tortugas, along with our trusty camerawoman, Grace. Say hi, Grace. So join us on this exciting expedition as we journey to the Dry Tortugas National Park. Uncover the mysteries of the past, Learn about what science was conducted here, how the tradition of science continues today, and gain a deeper appreciation for the natural wonders of this protected area. That flight was gorgeous, wasn't it? Yeah, I loved it. My first seaplane flight. Me too. Cool. Hey, I'm gonna go meet up with Curtis, see what's going on. All right, well, I got somebody to meet on the docks. All right, see ya. See ya. In the summer of 1905, a marine biologist named Alfred Mayer opened a tropical marine laboratory on Loggerhead Key. He saw a need for a lab where scientists could study natural history and conduct experiments. The Carnegie Institution of Washington agreed to pay for the lab. Both Mayer and the Carnegie Institution wanted to strengthen American science and rival the famous marine laboratories in Europe. Once it opened, the Carnegie Tortugas Lab hosted scientists every summer until 1939. The most popular feature in the park is massive Fort Jefferson on Garden Key. It was built and occupied by Americans during the 1800s. The fort reveals these islands' significance for sailors, trade, and military affairs. But this building has a hidden connection to the rich marine life of the Tortugas. Curtis taught me all about it. These islands, this place, provided much needed sustenance for those sailors. It also provided demise and even death to some. There are over 300 historic shipwrecks that we have located in the park. Now, in the 1800s, the US Navy said, these coral reefs, we're losing so many of our own ships as well. We need to start blowing channels through the actual reef and blowing the coral up. That sounds really horrible to us now. It, it but I'm does. sure back in the day, people thought nothing of it. They didn't know what yeah. coral was. They didn't know it was a keystone species, how many other things that supported the beauty and the mm -hmm. life and the mm -hmm. uh, tropic cascading effects that happen if we don't take care of our corals. So there's a lot of brick, <laughs> but I understand there's actually coral in the fort, in the walls, right? Good point, and that's another one. It's not a fact that a lot of people know. This place is much more than just a big pile of bricks in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> we also have a whole lot of coral that was used to build this fort. Can we go see some? I can to totally take you somewhere and right. show you some, and you will be able to understand the gravity of how much coral okay. is actually inlaid in this fort. Let's go. Let's check it out. Let's check it out. So Curtis, we're now on the second floor of the fort, and tell me about the walls. So the bricks, that 16 million bricks, it's really just the outer two layers, but the walls of the fort were made eight foot thick. Now look down, what did they use to make this whole oh, eight Oh, this is foot? all coral, I recognize This that. is all coral right Jeez. here. So they made basically concrete. 
It's a northern controlled fort in the southernmost part of the United States, so therefore they had to get building materials and bricks from as far away as Maine, over 2,000 miles. But what building materials did they have that were readily accessible? Yeah, sure. They're all right out there, and there are these beautiful, living, amazing coral reefs that support all kinds of life. Yeah. But just like the Navy in the 1800s and the government that wanted to blow up these corals, we didn't understand the significance of them. Yeah. And it's just amazing that you can look and you can see how much of the coral literally makes up this fort. Curtis, all this coral makes me think that this place is almost like a monument to coral death and destruction, right? In some ways, you're absolutely right. It pains me. I mean, for instance, the one that I'm holding right here, Acroporus cervicornis, also known as staghorn, mm -hmm. it's a federally endangered species. Yeah. And we use millions of pounds to create this fort. However, it's not all death and destruction today because our mission has totally changed. At the very location the government once blew up reefs to build a fort, the National Park Service and its partners now work to protect corals. Hyatt got to check in with one of those scientists. So what are you doing here? Uh, so I just saw you working with your bucket and I this thing, I'm not really sure. We are assessing coral reef health across the park. We look at how the reefs are changing over time. A lot of us are brought on to uh, prepare for the stony coral tissue loss disease. Stony coral tissue loss disease is a very devastating disease to corals. It's really easy to spot underwater because you see bright white. So, you know, the corals are usually supposed to be all these beautiful, vibrant colors. But when the coral is dying or when the coral is dead, you just see bright white and you can identify stony coral tissue loss disease by this really stark bright white line between the dead coral tissue and then the living coral tissue. We've lost a lot of coral cover from the disease. We don't know exactly what causes it, if it's a bacterial or a viral agent. In the meantime, we have found that a uh, antibiotic treatment is effective in at least halting the disease. Oh, wow. How do you administer this antibiotic? We mix up our amoxicillin antibiotic powder. Just like how people, people take the same amoxicillin as used to treat coral. <laughs> so that needs a delivery device, right? Because it is a powder. So this is called base to be. It's basically a really kind of like mushy, sticky material that was developed. Oh, it's sticky, because I thought it looks like jello. Do you mind if I look at yeah, it? Sure. It's really actually quite sticky and it gets over, That's interesting. over everything. So, <laughs> in the park, we were anticipating the disease was going to be very... Is that a caulk gun? I'm sorry, is that a yes, caulk gun? This, is this like what you would get from the hardware store? It is exactly wow. what we would get from the hardware store. A lot of complicated so. scientific uh, tools that you're using. Yes, yes, I know. Science <laughs> is really innovative a lot of the time. What is it that drives you to get out here, be far away from society, get in the water every day? What is it that makes it all worth it? I've seen with my own eyes a reef go from this beautiful, bustling, lively environment to something that's degraded due to this disease in particular, and I've also seen it due to other, you know, human and natural impacts and and seeing the beautiful and really important resources that we have within this park makes me want to prevent that from happening, at least to the best of my ability. Thank you so much for spending time and explaining this to us. And thank you for showing us your tools, but I'll let you get back to work. Sounds good, right. it was I'll great see meeting you. you. Great meeting you. <laughs> now I wonder if this makes Carly a coral doctor. Carly and her colleagues are doing wonderful work. They're part of the scientific legacy of all the people who came here to study at the Tortugas Lab. Tomorrow, we'll get out to Coral Reefs and Loggerhead Key and the site of the lab. But for now, we're enjoying some of the nocturnal life around the fort on Garden Key. The sun is setting and I'm walking by this bush and I hear what sounds like rain. And I look up, there's no rain. It's all a bunch of hermit crabs all in this bush. It literally sounds like rain dropping. Do you hear that? Look at this guy right here. You can hear a really big one, big fat one over there. That's my fist. I've never seen this many hermit crabs in my life. And the hermit crabs weren't the only creatures that emerged with the moon. Curtis broke out some black lights to reveal a critter that we couldn't see well with the naked eye. Scorpions. The blue-green glow comes from a substance found in the hyaline layer, a very thin but super tough coating in a part of the scorpion's exoskeleton called the cuticle. 
The next morning, we got up bright and early to meet Curtis down at the docks for our journey to Loggerhead Key. Good morning, Curtis. Good morning, hi. Good morning, Curtis. Good morning, Tim. How are you? Good, good. You guys ready for a little uh, boat ride over to Loggerhead? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm so excited to be out on the water. Looks like a beautiful day. Our first stop was a colony of magnificent frigate birds. Largest wingspan to body weight ratio of any bird in the world. It's like they own the air. Those are the kind of birds that you look at and you're like, wow, those are definitely related to dinosaurs. Like, those are pterodactyls. So Sweet. Seeing the wildlife from the boat is amazing, but we know there's a world of marine life down there. It's time to dive right in. How exciting it was to swim in the very place that inspired Mayer and other scientists. And by filming, we connected with a little history of technology. The world's first underwater color photographs were created right here at the lab. A biologist named William Longley was studying how the color of fishes could camouflage them against the reefs. He collaborated with National Geographic photographer Charles Martin to solve the problem of providing enough light to expose the photographic plates several feet below the surface. They built an underwater camera that was connected by a wire to a floating raft filled with a whole pound of magnesium flash powder. Enough to kill a person. When the diver pushed the shutter button, the powder exploded in a bright white fireball. And it worked. They published these photos in National Geographic magazine in 1927. Yeah, 251, 230 here. We are in route loggerhead ETA 10 mics. Land home. After landing on loggerhead to find the site of the Tortuga's lab, we decided to get an aerial view from the top of the lighthouse. Hey, we're going to the lighthouse right now. It's freaking huge. It's also really, really hot. So. I've heard the stories about how hot this can get. Let's experience it for ourselves. You know, the, and the, uh, the black is, is just kind of the beach side of it. It's what's about. Yeah, so where was the lab? Right, over there. right on this end here. Um, I think the lab itself would be more like kind of where that clear area is right now. Oh, right there. So it was right on the edge of the water. Yeah, there was a dock that went out. Mayer planned and built his lab on the north end of Loggerhead Key. It operated for 34 summers, from 1905 to 1939. At any one time, the lab could house about 12 scientists, all invited by Mayer himself. Over the decades, they studied everything, from the geology of coral reefs to the chemistry of fertilization and development of embryos. To skim one of Mayer's annual reports to the Carnegie Institution, is to survey the natural world from the level of a cell to that of an ecosystem. Tropical marine diversity, marine biodiversity is just so inspiring for so many people. And I think that's been true for so very long. People from all walks of life are like, wow, these beautiful coral reefs. Mayer was a jellyfish biologist, and when I was snorkeling, I was like up close with these moon jellies, some of which, a couple of which were like this big. That was really exciting for me. Do you, do you see jellies around a lot? They're gorgeous, we do. We see, we see them around quite a bit, and they are. You can see the reproductive organs in those moon jellies, the four circles that are there. I love the way the light shines through those. They sting you, it's not too bad. You just have to watch out for the Portuguese man of wars that come in around February timeframe. Those will really reach out and get you. I think one of the best 
Examples of the rich biodiversity here is Alfred Mayer himself. When he knew he had a terminal illness, he chose to be here and immerse himself in these resources rather than a hospital. Right, and then he died on the beach. He died on the beach. Right, what, it, that's it's like, that's the perfect ending for a marine biologist, is to die on the beach. <laughs> and that's that's the way yeah. that he wanted to live, you yeah. know. To me, yeah. it, it's, it's just an absolute beautiful place from a personal perspective. After being in the military and doing multiple engagements overseas, this is a place where I find my identity, where I find my zen, where I'm able to see the beauty above, but then I put a mask on underwater and it is like a whole new world. And I don't worry about common stresses. It is just, it's the way that I could really connect with this place. While Tim and Curtis discussed the connection between Mayer and the park's biodiversity, I went to meet up with someone who's been on the island for months, continuing the tradition of science in the park today. You're the turtle mother, I'd say. <laughs> I'm Maddie. Um, I'm interning with the Park Service this summer with their sea turtle monitoring program. We have about 150 loggerhead nests on the beach wow, right now. 150? It's definitely a, been a good year for them and our population I think is doing pretty well. Oh, great. Uh, here in the Dry Tortugas we have our own genetically distinct subpopulation. Basically the turtles, these turtles aren't going to North Carolina. Okay. So the genes here kind of stay within. So they're like, this is it, this is heaven, I'm not leaving. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, as you may or may not know, turtles come and they nest at the same beach they were born at. Um, so all yeah. these turtles that are hatching today are gonna come back if they survive later um, to nest here as well. One in every couple thousand survives wow. to adulthood. And they, they lay about how many eggs per clutch? About a hundred. A hundred? So, to yeah. make their likelihood higher. There's yeah. more and more and more babies. Yes. In comparison to the past hundred years, there hasn't been a lot of women out here doing science. You know, yeah, it is a little rare sometimes to see yeah. women out there doing stuff yeah. and having these positions. So I think yeah. it's been a great experience. Like I'm really happy to have been chosen for it and um, been able to work with some of these other great people. It's really cool to see how science continues here in the modern way with young, fresh minds. Thanks for being out here and doing this. Yeah. As Maddie continued her work as turtle mother, we decided to explore the island. To be on this island, untouched by modern society, we're seeing nature exactly as those scientists did at the Carnegie Lab those many years ago. As clouds rolled in, we got a call on our walkie-talkie from Maddie, and she had a little surprise for us. Some baby turtles that she's been helping incubate have started to hatch, and it's time to release them. You release them at night. What is there like a certain spot that you look for to release them? Typically, we try to release them kind of where we find them. Okay. Or where we excavate. Yeah. Can we go ahead and release them? All righty. Yeah. As a field ecologist, I've always felt my work helped understand or repair our world. But nothing I've done professionally gives me a greater sense of hope than releasing baby sea turtles to the ocean. There they go. Seeing these little critters reminded me that the tiniest creatures can possess incredible strength and resilience. Go, little dudes! Go, little dudes. <laughs> well, all right. Yeah, Time I think it's too much rain. Time to go. Be careful. Uh, Looks like it. That's it. Whoa. We're deep in it, Grace. Yeah, this is the most it's rained in a minute. Do you want to have to have an extra towel uh, for the yeah, camera? Mayer died in 1922. Carnegie closed the lab in 1939 because it was not feasible to operate a laboratory for only three months a year on a faraway island repeatedly hit by hurricanes. Now, Hyatt and I are looking for one of the only things left. The lighthouse is behind us and we are here at the location of the actual laboratory. All that remains is this plaque and it's even obscured by these sea oats. But I'll read the plaque, it's a memorial to Alfred uh, Mayer and it says, 
Alfred Goldsboro Mayer, who studied the biology of many seas and here founded a laboratory for research for the Carnegie Institution, directing it for seven, 18 years with conspicuous success, brilliant, versatile, courageous, utterly forgetful of self. He was the beloved leader of all those who worked with him and who erect to his memory, born 18, 68, died 1922. <laughs> They're Roman numerals and it's like, uh. <laughs> so here we are, this is it. It's a neat place. What I've learned is that Dry Tortugas hosted a laboratory during a period of great change in the study of life. There was a shift from natural history with its focus on collecting and describing specimens to biology as an explanatory and predictive science, one with experiments, hypotheses, and the fundamental organizing principle of evolution. Mayer and his colleagues and this place were very much a part of that transition. And today the science continues to grow to include conservation and restoration of species and ecosystems. This trip has been absolutely stunning. Literally nowhere else on earth is like the dry tortugas. And I, you know, I'm saying goodbye, but I know I'll be back. It's more like a see you later. As we set sail back to Key West, I can't help but feel grateful for this incredible adventure that we've had. Meeting with Curtis, Carly, and Maddie reminded us that science is still making waves in this one of a kind national park. From uncovering the location of the Carnegie Lab to swimming in the vibrant coral reefs. This expedition was unforgettable. My takeaway, science in the Tortugas never stops, even if laboratories and people come and go. Dry Tortugas, we'll miss you, but we'll be back in no time to these islands of discovery.